debugger a feature. So if it's not working, um, the same thing. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, all right. So um, for attendance today, kind of hates to sit. Uh, we could do it the long, hard way. Um, and just send me an email. Say you were here today. Uh, and uh, I will have fun at, at turning that into something useful. Um, okay, so any other questions, concerns? All right, I, I think, so I switched my account, or I got them to switch my account to work correctly, and it seems like it broke all of you. So, sweet. Um, okay, but I'll try to sort it out tomorrow. <clears throat> So today we're talking about presentations, but before we do that, I uh, made a bunch of changes. So I decided that the projects were getting a little off to a slow start. So the midterm presentations before break didn't make a lot of sense. So I moved it to the Thursday after break. Okay, so that's, I think the 17th. Um, two components to that. So first of all, your presentation, and we'll talk about what's in the presentation later in the lecture. but. The, the grade scope submission is due midnight on the 16th, and then you'll actually present in class on the 17th. My suspicion is we won't get them all done on the 17th, so we'll bleed into whatever the following Tuesday is, okay, which I might have written down. Um, so, make sense? All right, so just basically don't worry about the midterm thing until after that. We are going to start it today, so you know, feel free to work on it if you can. Um, but I know everybody's got midterms coming up. I don't want you working on it over spring break. Um, you know, I expect it to take a, you know a couple few hours. Uh, you know, but getting it done after break should be enough uh, time to do it. Uh, assuming you get started now, we might also have another lecture like slot between now and break where you'll have some more time to work on it. So uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if the syllabus got updated yet, but it will be uh, to reflect changes. Um, but you know, that's that's the situation. Uh, so it is a group project, right? So one submission with everyone's name on it makes my life a lot easier. Another thing, and I put this in the grade scope note, but um, I know it doesn't seem like it, it makes a ton of sense because I know it doesn't to me, but when you upload your PDF of your presentation, please try to make sure the file name has something about your project name in it uh, so that I don't just get 16 PDFs that are midterm presentation. Um, it makes my life easier because when grades go downloads them, if I download them kind of all at once, I just get whatever name you uploaded it as. So please try to put the project name in. If you forget, it's not the end of the world, it's just a game. Uh, okay, the other thing is that during that session, during those lectures, or during those presentations, you need to fill out a Google form about all the other presentations. So you don't do your own, you just do all the other presentations. And it's basically like, did you understand what the problem was? Did you understand what their solution is? Did you think it was a good solution? Did you have any feedback on it, et cetera? Um, we'll talk about that more in a minute as well. Um, now, you know, one hand giveth, the other hand taketh away. Um, so yes, I moved the midterm presentation till after break, but I have put the team agreement in between now and break. So again, that shouldn't be a huge amount of work. That is a group submission. It's basically like what we did in class, um, but there's a grade scope for it. It should have a template that you're gonna fill in. And you know, let's try to do a good job, but it's kind of a hard thing to uh, do very poorly on. Uh, basically, you'll, you'll be negatively graded if I think you did it in 15 minutes. Um, but other than that, you know, uh, most things work. Uh, again, group project, one submission across the team. Uh, and so that's due just before break. Uh, I want to say that's the Friday, but I can't remember. Um, I'm very bad with days. This is why I'm not a project manager. All right, any questions? All right, cool. All right, so today we're going to talk primarily about presentations and giving presentations. Um, and first and foremost, uh, why do you do that? Um, uh, you know, why are we covering this? Because there is no way that you will get into a career in software 
where you are not on a regular basis giving status updates on your projects in some sort of presentation style. Um, and so what we're trying to teach you here is like, okay, how do you present kind of where you're at and in a way that um, my, my argument is these presentations are targeted at kind of management, but not necessarily executive leadership. Okay, so that would be a different kind of presentation. Um, but let's see, what else? Uh, but yeah, so the midterm is kind of like a dry run for the final presentation, uh, which should be, hopefully, will be a really good tight uh, kind of status update uh, that you would give in, uh, you know, in a job. All right, so first and foremost, uh, when you're speaking, um, oh, I forgot I still have to fix this. Um, so uh, focus on the audience, uh, not on the speaker. Uh, as an audience member, it's actually very polite to also focus on the speaker, but uh, that is a typo on the slide. Um, so this is the classic, uh, you know, uh, picture everyone, uh, you know, in their underwear to make yourself less nervous. Uh, the one I use actually is, uh, I like to try to make a lot of eye contact, except looking directly in someone's eyes is somewhat nerve wracking, both actually for the person you're looking at and for yourself. So I actually look at people's foreheads, which has the appearance of me looking in your eyes, but isn't actual. Uh, so, uh, and actually I do uh, more direct eye contact now that I have a lot more experience, but that's how I started out doing it. And if I'm in a room with a thousand, uh, I tend to still do that trick. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's really important, as you notice, right? I'm looking around the room on a regular basis. I'm trying to incorporate everyone. Uh, I actually had a class where there was like, the podium was like right here. Um, and so I asked people not to sit there because I couldn't see them. Um, and so, you know, that kind of thing, just try to make sure that you can regularly engage uh, everyone in the room. Um, another one is don't read, okay? So don't read your slides, okay? This slide isn't bad, but this is even heavy on text uh, for most of my presentations, which, and one of the things I'll make a distinction on is there's lots of actually different types of presentations that you'll give or one could give, right? So one is a lecture like you do in a class or something like that, where my slides tend to be very text heavy for a couple of reasons. One, because we're trying to teach here, which means that uh, you want to give people different modes of, of learning. So some people are big readers. Some people are big on oral or, or voice, right? Um, A-U-R-A-L. Um, and so as a result, there's a lot of text. The other thing is that it's very likely that one or more of you will miss at least one class. So I want the slides to kind of stand on their own so that if you do go back and look at the slides, they still make sense. Or if you want to use them for study, they still make sense. If I'm giving a conference presentation, however, um, I tend not to have almost any text on the slide. Um, does anybody know why I don't want to have text on the slide in general, like in principle? You want them to engage with what you're saying and not be spending time staring and trying to digest both text and. Voice. Right. So, yeah, there's Bill there. For example, this is way too much text on the slide. Why? Because of what you're all doing right now. You're reading it. Okay. And when you're reading, you don't listen. So as a result, if I put up a whole bunch of text, you're gonna stop listening to what I say while you read whatever it is. So if for some reason you do have to put up a slide that has a ton of text, literally say, I'm gonna pause for a minute while you read this, okay? Then you kind of wait until people shift their eyes back to you. That's usually the indicator that they're done reading, usually. So, I try very hard to avoid this, but if it's there, uh, people will read it. Um, so going back here, um, okay, does anybody know what happy feet is? This was funny because, uh, so I played soccer for a long, long time, and there is a series of drills that are referred to as, like the set is referred to as happy feet. That's not what we're talking about here. Uh, this is actually comes from like theater terminology, which is the, uh, and it, it's, it's very hard to demonstrate because you do it, it's one of those things you do unconsciously, so it's hard to do like on demand, but it's where you kind of like move around for no reason, okay? Like I'm just kind of moving, right? 
Um, it's very, very distracting, okay? Most people do it when they're nervous. So the trick is to be not nervous. Uh, you can move, okay? But you have to do it with, like, with a goal, like an objective, okay? So if I walk over here to point to something, you know why I'm doing it, right? I'm moving with purpose. Um, even pacing can be uh, okay. Um, it's, it's funny, uh, you know, TED Talks, uh, I don't know if they have like a training manual or something, but like every TED Talk speaker paces constantly. Um, I think it's, I think it's a bad thing personally, um, but it does seem to be that like executive leadership level talks or whatever tend to have a lot of pacing, uh, which I, I don't know. I don't know why it's advised, but I think it's not great. Next one is volume, okay? This is very difficult for a lot of people. Um, you know, I was a camp counselor. So as a result, I can be heard across like a field if I want you to be, you know, if you want to, if I want you to hear me. Um, so I'm very good at projecting my voice. Um, so I can usually be heard. I actually have the opposite problem when I'm doing like a thousand person talk is that I have to control, like be quieter when I'm using a mic, right? Because I'll forget because I'm expecting project and I'll just blow out the mic because I'm too loud. However, most people have the opposite problem, okay? When you're nervous, you tend to drop your voice volume. Um, and so if you have a particularly deep voice or a particularly high voice, uh, this can be really extra difficult to understand. So if you're not sure, ask, right? Most of the time your audience is on your side. So ask them if they can hear you. All right. And so the biggest thing, most important thing, if you want to reduce some of those, is rehearsing. So if you rehearse it, you will drive your nervousness down, which will make you not do happy feet, not drop your volume because you're nervous, um, and you, you'll know the slides well enough that you don't have to read them. That makes sense? So rehearse, 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 rehearse. It is very important. It really makes a difference. Um, it will also, like, the more you rehearse something, the tighter the way you'll say it will be. It's funny, I've actually given talks where, like, and I give the same talk a few times, and it literally goes from, like, a 40-minute talk to a 35-minute talk to a 30-minute talk, and then I'm like, I need to add some content because it's getting really short now. Uh, so it gets tighter. You, you do a better job of communicating it. Your examples get better. Your examples are, are like fresh and tight. You're not like trying to remember. So rehearse, 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 rehearse. All right, so my uh, bad reading of words on slides example, um, this is very, very tempting to do, okay? Especially when you're presenting something from like tech doc because you already wrote this, right? And so you just cut and paste it and bang, you're done, right? Not good enough, gotta do it tighter, okay? All right, another big thing, remember the size of the fonts and the room, okay? And related to that, uh, think about color um, in a couple different ways. I actually use a terrible template for any sort of um, like visual impairment it is much more difficult to read light text on a dark background than dark text on a light background. So if you do make it the way I do, and over, over a break that I decided to have COVID instead of uh, fixing slides, I didn't get a chance to update the template, but you actually have to blow up the font and make it bigger if it's dark uh, light text on dark backgrounds. Otherwise, it's less readable. Um, color should be used with purpose, okay? And what that means is like, it should add information. Um, and in a slide or two, I don't think it's the next one, but in a slide or two, I'll show you an example of that. But be careful of colorblindness, okay? So I used to play uh, like a game on my phone um, that had some kind of subtle variations in color and I didn't even really see them that well. Uh, so I put on their colorblind mode. And so what they did was they kept the colors but they also added like in some dots, they had a plus sign and some dots they had, you know, an asterisk or whatever to indicate the differences. So instead of it being yellow and orange, I could also tell by the character that was embedded in it. So if you can add some information where if you lose the color because you're colorblind, you have visual impairment, et cetera, you can, you can find other ways uh, to convey that information 
uh, with uh, like in addition to the color. I don't normally recommend removing the color because for somebody who can consume it, it's very easy to understand, but you want to have a backup for people who can't. Uh, so if you think about like websites, right, images should have alt text, right? So if you can't load the image for whatever reason, like you're blind, the alt text describes what the image is. So you don't want to lose the image because the image is valuable to people who can see it, but you want to have a fallback position for people who can't, okay? Um, the other one is grammar, spelling, and accuracy. So this is, first of all, a pet peeve of mine. Uh, I worked for a newspaper for a while, so I don't know, maybe that was the problem. I used to run a newspaper, uh, my college newspaper. I was the editor for a while. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a stickler for this. Um, I still can't use the right two ever, um, but other than that, generally I'm pretty good. However, the reason I tend to grade on this is because it, working in software, your primary mode of communication in your workplace will be written, okay? Both in code itself, right? So you gotta make sure you have spelling, you know, comments are spelled correctly. Grammar matters, right? Because it can change the meaning of something if you miss a comma. So being good at it is important. And if it's, if English, for example, is not your first language, you need to find ways to compensate for that, okay? And so, Grammarly is out there. What I do with Hun is actually ask somebody to read something for me. If I know something is particularly tricky to like articulate or something, I'll ask someone to read it. Anytime I'm going to send an important email, I almost always ask somebody to read it first. Okay, just to get a second set of eyes on it. And we'll have a, a funny example from last semester about that in a minute. Uh, Camilla may remember. We'll see. All right. Any questions? Okay. All right, so this is an example of size, right? So this is nearly unreadable, right? This does not belong in this slide. So you can do a couple of things. If this is important information, then you need to do something to, to show it so they can read, okay? So what you can do is like do a zoom in build slide, right? That's one way to do it. Um, but if it's not important and it often isn't, I would literally blur it out because the problem is not just that it's small and unreadable, but also that if it's not particularly useful information, all of you are gonna to try to read it anyway, okay? And so as a result, you're again, concentrating more on that than what I'm saying. Uh, so yeah, say, I mean, basically the same problem. That's not my color example. Um, so this one I think is particularly interesting. Uh, so can anybody tell me what, the blue here is telling us. Anyone? Can anyone tell me what it's not telling us? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it's uh, like the components that they are on the page as coded by us. Right, so it's telling you what the components are. You know what also tells you that? The word components and the lines. Why is it blue? Okay, like, like you're not adding any information. So what might be a good use of the blue would be to like do a feature going across, right? Something that you crosses the, the boxes or something. But just coloring it for the sake of coloring it makes me look at it and say, this is somehow important to me, but I don't know why, okay? And then on top of that, why is this blue? Just for fun? Like that looks like a happy point. I agree. But that's not a good reason to color it for. That makes sense? Yeah. I think it adds like a pop of color to the slide. So. Yes. So if we were doing fashion, I would agree with you. So if you if you really wanted to keep it, then do them all, right? So do blue, do pink, do green. I don't know. Pick your colors, right? But do them all. Because the fact that it's alone doesn't tell me what it is. There could also be a note here that says, these are the parts we coded. That might be a piece of information that you want to tell, right? That all the stuff previously existed or something. Um, you are seeing this out of context, so there could be voiceover that would tell you all that. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly trashing it because it's, it's a good, funny example. Um, but I don't literally mean anything necessarily bad about this particular slide that Camilla may have had a hand in. Um, so it, it's because you are getting it completely out of context. But the point being is just, if you can't tell from looking at this picture what the blue is for, it's not adding value, okay? 
All right, this is this is the one that I find particularly funny. Um, so does anybody know what's wrong with this slide? Um, the blue bit is my overlay. This is what I think is so funny about this mistake. No one? Any ideas? Yeah, the project name is wrong. The project is called the mindful applicant. That says the mindful application. Those are two different things, right? <laughs> like, you know, so so this is this is the kind of thing where if I wrote this and made this mistake, I promise you I will never find it. I will never see it. Every time my brain is going to go over it thinking it's right. So this is the kind of thing where you need somebody else to take a look at it. And hopefully they catch it. They won't always, right? But hopefully they'll catch it. Um, but instant brain fix for that kind of thing. So be really careful of those. They're really, they're really easy to fall into um, and you know difficult to get out of. All right. So so those were some kind of bad-ish examples. Here's a good example. So this one, um, I have a little bit of a problem with it in that I probably would have stopped at like four because the font's really small. But part of it too is like this picture is of a slide that should be the full size, right? So it's bigger than it looks. That makes sense? Um, but what I really like about this slide is that in order to fit more information here, it dumps a bunch of it from the individual pieces because this as a student applies to all of these. So they extracted that piece. So you only have to process it once. Same with the so that over here, right? And then on top of that, this arrow implies so that, right? So I, I think this is a really well done slide. It really makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the only problem I had with it a bit was that the text is a little heavy. Arguably, it's because of the size of the picture and also arguably the nature of the content may require, a, you know, a bit more text than you would like to put on a slide. But it's kind of the idea that it's, you know, not too sophisticated, but really does show a lot of thinking about how they want to present the data. All right. Oh, there's a lot of uh, examples here. So this one I also really like, okay, where this team decided there was just no way they could put all the information in one slide. So they made four, which is great because um, it just kind of separates out the information. The thing is four slides theoretically can take a lot longer to process or like deliver than one slide, right? However, they did a couple of really smart tricks to make it so that each slide is easier to consume. If you notice, the layout of each slide is exactly the same. So when you're going between them, your brain doesn't have to parse the layout each time, okay? I'll tell you right now, though, this is kind of difficult to do just because if this corner here is not exactly in the same place as that corner there, your brain will really negatively react, It'll really slow it down. So you gotta make sure it's really perfect. Um, but I really like this because the only differences are uh, the new information. So you can immediately jump to it when you go through the slides. Um, and it tries to solve the problem of how do I get 30,000 pieces of information in the, you know, in the one slide without uh, totally overwhelming the consumer. All right. So this one, um, we're gonna talk about this in a minute. Um, does anybody know what a architecture is? So this is half a joke and half serious. Sorry, does anybody know what an architecture is? Architecture, ring any bells? All right, tell me what an architecture is. It's like a design for something. You know, it's software design, right? Um, so yeah, so it's, it's usually a drawing uh, that indicates what, uh, you know, an application, how it works, right? Um, However, they're usually too sophisticated to uh, give to somebody who is like a manager, right? Or somebody, sometimes even somebody outside your team. So one of the things that started to take over is this concept called a architecture. Does so anybody know why it would be called mark? Like what, what is that? What are, what are we merging together to get architecture? 
marketing and architecture because it doesn't actually describe the architecture. It's just like marketing buzzwords that are probably <laughs> useful or interesting. So that's the disparaging view of a marketing architecture. There is there is a positive view. Um, so yes, marketing and architecture combined together come up with marketing of uh, architecture, which often will be on a website and try to figure it, fit as many technical buzzwords as possible into the web page. Okay, cloud, container, you know, whatever. Um, however, the good purpose in my mind is it's a high level or more consumable version of the architecture that communicates to somebody who doesn't, who's not deeply technical or deeply involved in the project, roughly how it works, okay? So the intent is not to replace the architecture diagram, but instead to give you some context for an architecture diagram, or, you know, or you, you know, if you wanna skip the architecture diagram for that particular consumer, you know, it gives you something, something to give them an idea of how it works. All right, so this is moving on to the actual midterm. Um, so a set of slides, and these are all the content that it must have, okay? You can also add anything else that you think seems appropriate, but these are the things that it must have. So it must have the name of the project or client. I prefer project, but if you, you know, if it doesn't really have a name or whatever, I don't know if they have any like that, you can use the client name. Names the team members, okay? I want to know who all the participants are. It has to have a problem statement, okay? Now keep this in mind that the problem statement that's coming from the project description is a lot of words for one slide, right? So you want to think about other ways to, to you know, share that information without writing a paragraph and a half on a slide, okay? Main user stories, okay? You saw that example earlier. So what are the major things that you're planning to do that's going to address the problem statement? Okay. A architecture, then it also a technical architecture, and then milestones and timeline. Okay. So when are you going to do stuff? And uh, I really should add another type of future here. So basically, because, you know, at any given point, right, theoretically, you're getting stuff completed and then new stuff is happening. Um, I put both of these. So basically, up to wherever you finish this, you know, the slide deck, that goes in the completed bucket. Does that make sense? But then future can kind of have two states. One is future stuff that you're going to do this semester, and future can also be stuff that you would think that they should do in future semesters. Okay. You don't have to have any of the latter. It's more like if you want to put them in, that's where you put them. Okay. All right, so the way you deliver this is, sorry, as a PDF to Gradescope, there's a reminder in the Gradescope assignment of the requirements like that list of items so that you don't have to reference this. Um, and then you actually have to present it on the 17th. So please try very hard to attend that class, okay? It's very, because I'm going to make you present it either way. So if you can't make the class, that means you get to come to my office hours and present it on your own. So I strongly recommend you come, okay? If you have a legitimate conflict, we'll figure it out, it's fine, but that would be a good class to not miss. Um, we'll try to get the schedule out, uh, you know, like that week basically to say, okay, we think we're gonna have these, you know, four go on the 17th and these four go on the 22nd. Um, but it's really tough to predict how long exactly the presentations will take. So we'll just at least have an order so you'll have a sense of, you know, what we might do. Um, like I said, if you have a legitimate conf conflict, if you let me know soon, I can make sure you're like last or first so that you can fall in one or the other classes. Um, you're going to have approximately 10 minutes to present. So as there's only eight projects, you would think we'd be able to do it in one lecture, but we probably won't because of like switching time, right? Um, every member of the team must present at least one slide, okay? As a result, one of the things that's very hard to do, co-presenting is terrible, okay? Transitions between people while giving a presentation are very, very difficult. I do not recommend them ever. 
the reason we're doing it this way is because I want to see you all present. But in general, it's a terrible idea. So as little like co-presenting is often very, very difficult unless you know the person really, really well. Um, but you can fix it with rehearsal. So what I would recommend is each of you individually rehearse your portion by yourself. Make sure you've got it comfortable so you're down with it, you know, whatever. You don't have to memorize it, but you have to be comfortable with it. Then get together as a team and do some rehearsal actually doing the whole presentation. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Uh, my worst story about that is uh, I was co-presenting with someone and finishing my slides while they were presenting. Uh, so that was in the case. Do not recommend. It did come off pretty well. All right. Um, so obviously we'll repost this, uh, you know, at time of. Um, however, this is the inter-team assessment. So basically, you know, you giving feedback to uh, all the teams. I'm not going to share uh, who the human is with the team, right? Um, but I will try to share content that you provide with the team that received it. Uh, if I'm saying that right, I think you know what I mean. Um, but I'm, I'll strip anything that will indicate who you are uh, out of it. I will also strip any bad language, mean things, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, but, oh yeah, so this is not a group assignment. This, everybody has to do, call it seven of these, okay? Make sense? My expectation is that you're doing it real time during class. However, in case you can't physically get it done for whatever reason, there's a kind of a grace period until the next lecture uh, to you know, finish typing it up. Um, however, in, in order to do that, the, the form itself is, is pretty dense. So I would recommend trying to read it in advance, uh, just so you know what it's going to say. Um, not because you really need to, like, you don't have to do anything with it, but if you've read it once, it'll make a lot more sense, I think. Questions? All right, uh, a few more samples, uh, just the ones we didn't really go over. I just thought this was a nice timeline, um, you know, from a project. Uh, so, you know, it tries to indicate when things are happening. So, and this, if you look at it, this is a milestone, okay? So as in, you kind of group a set of user stories together and say, okay, this is a, we're gonna call this a blog, okay? If you have to, you can just call it milestone one, milestone two, milestone three. But the idea is to kind of group some things together and maybe give it a fancy name, which will then make it easier to understand what's happening. Um, but then kind of down, uh, I guess these aren't great, but uh, so these should be kind of more like the user story level. Like what are the different things you're gonna do in that sprint, say. Um, milestones don't have to be at the sprint level. Uh, they often are, especially for such a short project. Um, there's not a lot of other room to put in milestones. But I just wanted to give you an example of this is what I mean by a milestone. This is what I mean by a timeline. Doesn't have to look like this, but get the idea. Uh, this is just an architecture blown up. I don't dislike this slide. Um, like I said, I just think it's a little rough on the fonts. Um, it would be much better if it was full screen, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, then a architecture example. And I'll post these slides. The idea of this is so you can kind of see what they are. Um, another Mark texture that I think is good. This one, um, you don't have a requirement to include this. If it's interesting or relevant to your project, you might want to. This is basically the deployment pipeline. So how does a, you know, a piece of code land in production? Um, and for this particular project, it was a useful piece of information. But that doesn't mean it is for you, OK? Just more examples. Um, and that might be all the slides. One thing I want to mention is uh, earlier today, I did a Piazza post for good sources of imagery that have um, like proper usability or like attribution or a proper like licenses so that you can use them. Because remember, I don't want to see anything in any of these that is not attributed to its source. That source might be you, like if you can draw, there you go. Um, I personally cannot, so I use a lot of stuff off the internet, but you gotta make sure you're using it with the correct license, okay? Um, and so the Piazza Post has uh, some ways to find 
content that is licensed appropriately. And if you have any questions about any given one or whatever, you know, feel free to let me know. Um, I mean, technically speaking, for this class, all of that would be covered under fair use uh, because you're doing it for classwork. Um, but we're treating it like it's more real, just to give you the experience. Uh, let's see. I was thinking about showing you uh, one of my other decks, um, but I might stop here. If I find it, or if I find a good one, I'll I'll bring it back up. But at this point, I want to say, all right, get together as teams, start working on that presentation. Okay. Um, that way you can ask us any questions you might have. Um, what else is here? Camilla, Matt, me. That's it, right? Am I missing anything? No. Okay. So uh, we're around so that you can ask questions if you don't understand anything we talked about. Um, and uh, that way you can get at least get started. And, uh, you know, and so I would like to see a slide, you know, like a, like a start before the end of the lecture, if humanly possible. I know you don't have a ton of time, but uh, hopefully you can get started. Any other questions? All right, cool.